Do you think homeschooling is impossible and keeping a clean house and managing your children? Well, let me tell you, it isn't. It's very doable. And today's guest on the Catholic Homeschool Podcast, Mary Ellen Barrett, is going to share with us her top 10 tips on how to homeschool and not lose your mind. Welcome to the Catholic Homeschool Podcast. I am so glad you're here. I'm your host, Paula Siskanik, and I am joined today by Mary Ellen Barrett. Hi, Mary Ellen. I I am so thrilled that you're here. You know, we were talking as before we start hitting the record button, how we could actually do this in several sessions because you are just such a wealth of knowledge. You have been an inspiration and a guide for myself, for so many homeschool families. So I am so thrilled you're here today. Oh, thank you. You're you're too kind, Uh, but I'm (laughs) thrilled to be here. You know how I love talking about homeschooling. So this is is great fun for me. Good. And you and I both have like experience there so we can help teach, you know, those that are just starting or even the veteran ones to say, here are all the mistakes we made. Try to avoid these, right? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. I always feel like it's nice, even if you've been doing it for a long time, to hear what other people are doing. It kind of refreshes you. You know, I always feel better at this time of year when I when I hear new stories and what people are doing. It just it makes me feel like I'm all right, I'm on the right path. Or oh yeah, that makes sense. I can change it. So So that is the topic of this podcast, which will be how to homeschool and not lose your mind. It was actually the title of your talk that you gave so generously. You did a live. Uh, talk for us for the Catholic Homeschool Conference in 2020, you know, that year when it was like everybody was homeschooling. And so I want to kind of revisit some of that stuff because we're now mid-year here. But before we get started, for anybody, in case anybody doesn't know Mary Ellen, I'm going to read the bio, okay? And then we'll start with a prayer after I read your bio, okay? Mary Ellen is the mother of eight children and has been married to her husband, David, for 30 years. At the end of this year, 30 years, yay. She currently works as the editor of the Seton Magazine, as well as heading up the special projects for them. She was a columnist for the Long Island Catholic for 15 years, and she has been homeschooling for about 20 years, graduating four thus far. She has been a speaker at the IHM conferences, as well as other Catholic women conferences. Mary Ellen loves traveling, reading, embroidery, and gathering with friends. So as I said, let's start with a prayer. I'd like to invite you into prayer, and we'll begin with the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, I thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for the gift of homeschooling, our marriages, our children, and for the choice to homeschool. Please bless all the families who hear this. Please bless Mary Ellen as she serves those who homeschool. We ask for the Blessed Mother to intercede for us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And we ask that uh, the Holy Family intercede for us and that um, we do everything to give God the glory through your son, Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. Yay. (laughs) So I, again, um, know that January after the holidays and, and, you know, this is a talk that actually it happens all times of year. Uh, You and I are talking in January, but I really think this is applicable to any time of year. One of the things you probably hear most, and I hear most from families is, how in the world can I do it all? I mean, how can I be there for my children, be there for my spouse, keep the house clean and homeschool? How can I possibly do that? And, And I know you came up with like this list of 10 things and it's something, you know, worth us revisiting. And I was wondering if we could dive into those 10 things on this talk today. Great. So I know the, there's so much richness in this, but I'd like us to talk the first, the first thing that you had mentioned. And as I said, in that original talk was discipline. And I wanted to ask you, um, is that like discipline for me or for the children? (laughs) It is for the mom, for me in particular, 
And I know it's so hard. Um, and I hate it too, quite frankly. <laughs> I don't want to do it. I am the kind of person who wants to sleep late and, you know, linger over the coffee and read a book and, you know, kind of ease into the day. But for my life now, especially now, and, and there are different seasons of life when, when you just do what you can do. But um, right now, if I don't get up quite early and get things rolling, I, I just, the whole day just is shot, really. So I get up at 5.30 and I detest getting up at 5.30. I have this, this um, watch thing. It's not an Apple watch. It's like, I am so cheap about electronics. I think it was 30 bucks on Amazon, but it wakes me up at 5.30 without waking up my husband. It buzzes on my arm. So that I can get up and say my rosary and have my time to myself for a half hour or so. Um, I say the rosary. I glance at the newspaper. I have a nice quiet cup of coffee. And then I, I get ready for the day at around 6, 6.15. Um, and that's just, it, it, the discipline is so important because it, it models what the children should be doing. When they see mom getting her work done in a disciplined and organized kind of way, they will naturally pick up on that. Like, like not right away. You might not say, you know, 12 year old boys are not going to become disciplined. You know, they're still going to be 12 year old boys, but they're going to see you're, you're going to model this so that when they are older, when they leave you, when they go to college, they know I have to get my work done before I play a video game or before I read the book or whatever, you know, go out for the run or any of those things. So I, when I get up in the morning, I have my little quiet time and then I focus on what needs to be done that day. What, my children need from me, what my husband needs from me and what the house needs from me. Um, And then the discipline will kind of leak through to the rest of the people, that kind of discipline. It's so important for mom. It's, it's just the number one thing. And believe me, I know it's hard. It's a mortification really. When you, when you would rather sit down and scroll through Instagram, but there's a sink full of dishes that have to be put away. And I, you know, I'm putting them in a dishwasher that washes them for me, but I'm kind of a baby about just like, why is that so difficult or emptying it? Oh my gosh. Why is it such a pain in the neck? But it is, <laughs> and we have to get it done. So I knew my off. husband at a certain season in my life, you know, he was very sweet. He'd get up and he'd bring me a cup of coffee in bed. But I, like you very quickly, I, I realized that I, I couldn't be on you know, like you're immediately at everybody's beck and call. And and so I needed Paula time instead of mommy time. (laughs) And so I had to do that hard thing, bite the bullet and get up before everybody else. Yeah, it is a hard thing. And and it might be a season of life where you can't, if you're up all night with a baby, then don't worry about that. And maybe you find your quiet time in the evening when the baby first goes to sleep or doing a nap. If you have, if you're surrounded by toddlers, my, my husband used to laugh because no matter how early I tried to get up, one of them would be following me down the stairs. (laughs) It's just, he would call it like the bed to chair radar or something like the minute my butt hit a chair or the minute I got out of bed, they were on. (laughs) So so you're in a season of life where it's important for you to find little pockets of time. And that's really hard. My children are older now. I drag them out of bed. (laughs) (laughs) It's It's a little easier for me to find quiet time because when they see me, they go running. Whereas when they're toddlers, you know, they want mommy, mommy, mommy all the time. So it's important for you. And maybe if that happens on a Saturday, because for many years, my husband would say to me on a Saturday morning, all right, go, go. And I would go to Barnes and Noble and wander around or go sit in Starbucks for a few minutes and just have a quiet cup of coffee. Just that, that quiet time, an hour or so by myself was so important to me being able to be disciplined when I was home. Right. Right, exactly. And I love, Mary Ellen, that you make that a point of different seasons of life, because it is going to look different. And it may look different even month to month, as you said, you know, uh, especially newborns in the house, you know, you're just desperate to get at least that extra little bit of sleep in the morning. And so it'll have to be different. Yeah. But I I like that overarching thing, discipline. Yeah, it is. It's it. And it looks different for every person. It looks different in every family, in every household. And you have to take into account your own personality, too. So that's important that you recognize, all right, am I the kind of person who needs the extra hour of sleep? Am I the kind of person who, who gets fed by constantly being around people? I don't need that quiet time. That, that, that's not important to me. Maybe I need to chat with a friend instead or, or you know, something like that or, or listen to music or an audio book or something. So you have to kind of figure out what feeds you enough that you can then, when you hit that ground running, when the kids are ready for you, 
how then you can be the disciplined person because you fed your you filled up your cup a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear from all of that, it's about self care, but like not in the popular empowerment, you know, worldly way. It's about your calling at this mm-hmm. stage of life. And yeah. self-care. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and for me, starting with the rosary is what helps me. I mean, prayer is so important. So important. Well, then let's, let's jump into, I know that's like, I have that as number four on your list, but <laughs> how about we just slide into that one prayer? Yes. You know, that is one of those important things, you know, um, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, why is that important? What, what does that kind of look like? And prayer encompasses so many different aspects. It does. It really, really does. Um, Whenever I neglect my prayer life, I start to find that the rest of my life is fraying at the edges and I'm more quick tempered and I'm just not as put together and I'm not as focused on what my mission here is. And then what I'm really good about my prayer life, those things seem to fall together. And it's not that my life gets so much easier. It's just that I'm better able to cope. It brings a peace to me. And I don't know if this is what everybody feels, but it, it just it brings a peace to me that I'm doing the right thing and I'm, I'm proceeding at what God intends for me because I'm constantly trying to discern his will. Mm-hmm. So I start with my rosary in the morning. Um, I pray with the children every morning before we start school. We have our little prayer routine. Um, and lately we've been adding, you know, people we know who've been sick and stuff, praying for those kinds of intentions, which is so good for children to see that you're, you're praying for other people and, and to see kind of mission in your prayer. Um, and then we pray when they were little, we pray every night before they go to bed. And we don't do that anymore simply because some of them are working, they're out there, you know, nobody's ever home at the same time. So that's a little bit more difficult. But I've also encouraged each of them to have their own prayer life. So I have kids who love the Divine Mercy Chaplet or who love the rosary or who just love reading the Bible and things like that. So I've made time for that. And I also in this past year, um, I, I did the Bible in a Year podcast which isn't specifically like you're sitting down and praying, but of course you're, you're absorbing the word of God, which I had, I had read the Bible before in college and in high school, but I had not absorbed it this way. So I found that to be very fruitful. So I think it's important for moms to find whatever it is that feeds your soul and helps you discern God's will for you and your family and put that prayer practice into your life. I mean, I actually even write it down in my planner. My planner's next to me and I write the most basic things to feed the dog <laughs> because if I don't write it down, it's not going to happen. And yeah. pray the rosary and do my exercise and my Bible study and things like that. And if you need that visual reminder, because as I'm running around during the day, I'm like, oh, I didn't do that yet. You know, I didn't feed the dog. I didn't take my vitamins. I didn't do this. Um, so I make lists like that. And that helps. <laughs> getting to that age where I get a little forgetful here and there. So I need a little help. What you had said is wonderful is this whole idea that if it's not written down, it doesn't happen, you know, and that is definitely something, you know, very, yeah. very true. It keeps um, writing something down is like a promise that it will happen. Like it gives structure to your day, at least for me. So when you find that, what that prayer practice that is good for you, Write it down in your calendar every day or have your phone beep or whatever it is and remind yourself to do that, to make that time. Yeah, that's awesome. I I know you also spoke about things like um, what about spiritual directors um, availing yourself of the sacraments? You know, um, is that something you also schedule out? I do. I do. I um, schedule every Friday morning. I go to 630 mass. And that's because I'm um, in the Rosary Altar Society at my church. So I, I, we clean the church and I, I uh, wash the linens and all that kind of stuff. So that is really set in stone that I do that. Um, and I started doing that when my children were quite small because I could be at 630 Mass because my husband was still home. Hmm. So that's why I did that. So it, and now it's just, you know, part of my life that I do this. But when your your children are small, to avail yourself of daily mass can be quite difficult because it can take up a huge chunk of your day. My my church is 90 seconds from my house. If I don't hit the one red light, I'm at church in 90 seconds. That's (laughs) easy. But if you're, you know, an hour from your church, daily mass is going to be very difficult for you. So you have to find a way to get to the sacrament, of course, on Sunday. But maybe there's adoration near you at a weird time when your husband's home. Because I used to do that too when they were young. I could go at three o'clock in the morning. You know, you can't go at three o'clock in the afternoon, but you can go at three o'clock in the morning, which is also a mortification. Um, getting to confession as often as you can. I, you know, 
need that badly. <laughs> do. And I read somewhere once that um, St. John Paul II went to weekly confession. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, I should just set up a tent in there and <laughs> live in confession. Because if he's going every week, I am in trouble. <laughs> but availing yourself, it's just, it, it just, like I said, it cleanses your soul and it gives you so, so much strength to get to confession and a good, great modeling for your children. You know, I'm a better mom when I go to confession more often and we'll all be better people when we go to confession more often. So, and it can be very difficult. I understand that. Um, there was a time when I thought if I didn't get to daily mass, I wasn't holy enough. And that's just nonsense because you're, God is calling you to, to minister to these children and to take care of their family. And sometimes daily mass fits into that and sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, you have to, you, have to expressed, you just expressed how different it's always, um, it is to everybody, you know, in their different seasons of life, because um, it, it didn't look the same when your kids were little versus when what you're doing now, you know, right. and, and that's really, really important so that like, you're not beating yourself up because as you said, you know, we could be scrupulous and say, I'm not going to daily mass. I'm not a good Catholic. And uh, my spiritual director, my husband and I, um, I'm a revert to the faith. And so I train, you know, I, I was preparing for our marriage, but I also prepared for my confirmation in that he became our spiritual director as a result of that. But he said early on, he's, you know, Paula, it's not going to be the same. Like I know God knows that your intention, but your work is, is an offering to him as well. So you, you can't get to daily mass. I, even now, you know, I do watch some of the masses and I do a spiritual uh, communion, if right. I can. And get. that's that's a lovely option to be able to watch daily mass. I mean, I, I was doing it during the pandemic. Um, now my my parish doesn't um, record the daily mass anymore, but um, other ones do. And also, your desire for the sacraments, even if you aren't able to participate in them every day, the fact that you have a desire for that is quite holy, I think, and sanctifying, because you know most people don't desire Christ that way. And when he sees that you want to be with him, even though you can't be, I mean, I, I can't but think that that pleases him greatly. So moms, when you, when you can't be there, or even on a Sunday, you can't be there, your baby is sick, or you're not feeling well, or, you know, there's five feet of snow on the ground or something, your desire is really, really holy and beautiful. Oh, that is so sweet. It really is. It's so true. God does read our hearts. And, you know, he gave you these children, the timing that he gave them in not to make it difficult for you, you know, and right. he's waiting there for you with all those graces in the time and the intention, as you said, that's really mm -hmm. beautiful, Mary Ellen. Um, there was this aspect too about prayer and, and maybe we'll get to that a little bit later, but, but one of the things that I think that comes into, and I'd like to dive into this number two, because this is really meaty. It's this whole idea of what works for your family, do what works for your family, you know, look at the things for inspiration, but not the comparison game. <laughs> Right. Yes, I know. Pinterest and Instagram have done a lot of harm for people because you look and I mean, I love beautiful pictures. We all love to see the perfectly curated homes and, and school rooms and living rooms. And but it can make you feel bad. It can really make you feel badly that my house doesn't look like that. I mean, I have a lot of people living here in a large, undisciplined dog. <laughs> just You know, it's just a mess a lot. And, and as we were talking before, I have kids who've moved out, they move back, they, they're here, they're gone. And on any given day, there's a mess somewhere. <laughs> and it's never Instagram worthy. But, and especially at this time of year, when, when people are um, touting their organizational solutions, and they're this and they're that, um, it can make you feel very, um, I don't know, not that good, not, not good enough. And you have to look at the family you're raising now and the season of life you're in now and what you have to accomplish every day and organize for that. And early on in this um, speaking thing that I was doing for IHM, I met a woman who had a very small house and didn't have a whole lot of room for her school books. So she had her husband take their coat closet. She put all the coats in the kids' bedrooms and he put shelving and he wired it. So I think their printer was in there. And so it became almost like a bookcase or something like that in her coat closet. And her mother-in-law just thought she was insane. How are you going to sell the house? That's, that's crazy. Nobody has that. And they weren't looking to sell their house. She was, and I thought she was a genius. She made her space work for her. Now, would it show up on Pinterest? Would it, would it be like a, an interior design thing? No, who cares? You know, she made it work for her. So look at your house and your spaces 
And don't worry if you, if you're having, you know, if you're crammed into a little schoolroom or a little closet, but your dining room is empty all the time, do it in the dining. I have homeschooled in my dining room for I, 15, 20 years now. We had a little schoolroom when they were quite little and then it just got, there's too much stuff. So there are cubbies still in my dining room. There are maps on the wall. You know, it all comes down at the end of the day and I set the table for dinner, but that's what works for me now. And it's my house and it's my family. So you have to do what works for your family and not for the Instagram influencer who I'm sure is a very nice person, but doesn't live your life and have your budget and have your husband and have your kids and your dog and your, your, you know, how many math pages have to get done that day and all that kind of stuff that we have to think about. Yeah, and then you mentioned um, getting inspiration, like the lady who did it before, you know, we can learn from each other ideas, like, you know, oh, does anybody have a good idea for a bookshelf? But again, make it specific to your right. family, to your needs, not to be as, and, it, and there is that temptation to set up a school room and you're not doing it right unless you do that. And I know, it, same thing, our family homeschooled at the dining room table. We did not have separate for all our homeschooling days. And I had a my coffee table actually became, it, it was like a little kid's table. And the, yeah. so the little kids on the coffee table with little chairs, the big kids on the dining room table. And yet books, school books were always put away because we had to eat dinner. Right. Yeah. Which is a nice motivation to get it all cleared off and put away neatly in their cubbies or their bags or wherever you keep it. And then you can have dinner. I, I just think it has to, we, we have to let go of the guilt that we're not doing it all perfectly you know, Instagram worthy or Pinterest worthy. I, I think you have to just do what works for you. For the first few years, I was, we had, a, we have a finished basement and we had a little school room set up there. And it was so nice. I was running up and downstairs all day long. I was so skinny. And then we moved to the dining room near the fridge and that all went away. <laughs> but now they're all, my youngest will be 13 next week. And my, the only other two I'm homeschooling right now are in high school and they're all over the house. Like sometimes they're at a desk in their room and sometimes they're sitting in a living room near the fireplace at this time of year. Sometimes they're in the dining room um, or they're walking around with their laptop saying, where's the Wi-Fi? Like the Wi-Fi is terrible today, you know? <laughs> so I, you know, for me, I prefer that we're all just sitting around together doing our work, but this is where they're comfortable and they're getting the work done. So, yes. you know, it works for our family right now. Might not next year. Who knows? Yeah, I think environment is something very important. We don't pay attention to that, even just lighting focus. And especially as the kids get into the high school years, you do want to kind of honor that for them, you know, in terms of them learning their own study habits and their ability to say, uh, I can't study in the dining room where everybody is. I need to have a zone where I can focus on this and that. It's good training for college too, because mm -hmm. you're not going to be hanging over them when they're in college or sitting next to them saying, all right, now read this page, read this page. <laughs> Nobody's right. going to do that. So it's good training when they're in high school to find yeah. their own way. Absolutely. So I knew uh, I just wanted to um, get back to that idea of, you know, planning and getting up earlier than you had said, of course, um, having the discipline to get up early if you can. Um, that was, again, your tip number three here, get up earlier than your children, you know. But one of the things that came out of that too was this idea of, um, you know, what is it that you expect your kids to do, you know what I'm saying, in terms of their routines, you know, there's something like, are they going to, you know, especially as they get into the high school years, do you require them to get up at a certain time or, yeah. I do. I, I like them out of bed by 730 in the morning. Um, we start, they, they can start their school day anytime after that they want, but we have morning prayers at nine o'clock. Okay. Um, so I like them to get up, make their beds, throw in whatever laundry in the hamper, that kind of them just kind of take care of their rooms a little bit. I honestly don't care if they come to school in their pajamas, you know, especially at this time of year, it's just a little cozier. Um, I do insist they change their clothes every few days. So sometimes yeah. they'll be like, I'm wearing that for like two days now. <laughs> it's time to change, especially the boy. Right. Um, but, and, and there are chores every day. They have certain chores. Some of them, and this, some of them have specific chores. Like I have one daughter who cleans the bathrooms. So she's very good at it. Um, but at some point I may switch that up because boys need to know how to clean bathrooms too. And somebody will cook lunch or there's the, the dishes that have to be done or the animal chores and things like that. So they do have specific chores, but I also assign things as I, you know, see something needs. Oh, could you just run and vacuum that and stuff like that? So they will 
kind of do some reading or some schoolwork a little bit ahead of nine o'clock, but at nine o'clock is really our official start. Okay. And then when we finish, usually around three, and we do take a lunch uh, lunch break in there, um, I expect them to put all their things away. And then if there are any other laundry chores or anything like that, the boys have um, wood splitting and some out. It makes it sound like I, I live very rurally. I don't. <laughs> I live on Long Island, which is very suburban. Chopping wood and getting the chores, yes. <laughs> getting water from the well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you would think, but um, we have a fireplace and we use that um, all the time. So they, they go out and do that. So once they're done with that, then you can have your video game or, you know, whatever it is you want to do, skateboarding and stuff like that. I know one of the things you mentioned was you have an ish schedule. I thought that was clever. <laughs> yes. Yes, I can't. I'm not very good with their like start at this time because things happen. And especially when you have little kids, you know, the diaper needs to be changed or the baby makes a mess and has to be thrown in the bathtub and things like that. So I was um, strove more for a rhythm, which is my ish schedule. So we start nine ish. We finish three ish. You know, if something gets if something um, is happening, if, if there's something outside to do or if there's um homeschool event well then you know the schedule gets changed or something and and dad's home a lot more working from home these days so you know dad is always exciting to be around <laughs> so if we if we have lunch with dad at the table then maybe we'll have a little bit longer of a lunch break to hang out with dad and things like that so I think one of the wonderful things about homeschooling is you can have an ish schedule you don't have to be on a bus at a certain time and have lunch at a certain time and all that kind of stuff. It gives you some flexibility to, to grow together as a family and to enjoy each other. Yeah. So that's, that's real. Okay. You know what I mean? So I, it's like, there's a framework is what you're saying, you know, have a general routine, but understand the reality is that we can't stick to it to the minute like you can, if you were in the military. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And certain things like tomorrow we have to go to a funeral mass for a dear friend who's, um, who's aunt died. So we're, you know, I, I'm, we're going to make time for that. So we're going to start our school day two hours late because we're going to a mass. So it's important to pray for people. Right. It's important to uh, take the meal to the, the pregnant, you know, sister or when somebody needs help with babysitting to, to welcome toddlers into your house and, and help your elderly neighbor. Those things are really important. So much more important than maybe starting math at 930. So you make time in the schedule, build your schedule so that it fits your life right now in this season that you're in. And when you say, I mean, especially when the children were little, I mean, I know my parents would always sometimes want to just pop in at any moment. And, and I maybe was a little, you know, more inflexible than I, but when the kids were little, they thrived on routine, knowing yes. what was coming. Yes, they do. Um, my kids used to know as soon as I started wiping down the dining room table after breakfast, that they were expected to be at the table within five or six minutes. So that's when they would look at me and then they'd go get their books or find their pencils or whatever. So that was a signal because we would have our morning stuff to do. But as soon as mom started doing, you know, the wiping down, they knew that it was like, a, and there were points during the day when I started doing things that they knew the next thing was going to happen. And that yeah. is important. So it's like that consistent trying to give, give them the ability to, this is something I can count on. It's building lifelong habits, but it is hard as a mom to, you know, be consistent about those things. And as they say, not to beat yourself up about it, but one of the things I wanted to talk about, and I know you mentioned was about meal planning is something that, you know, a big thing you talk about too. I, I know I resist it and you inspired me. Like I need to sit down with my family and get back to meal planning, but it seems to me, Mary Ellen, you're talking about these routines, discipline, st structure, but even though it's hard, it's actually causing, giving you freedom, less overwhelm. Is that right? Yes. yes. I have so much more free time now that I've embraced the idea of organizing my life. So many little chores are just taken care of without me thinking about it. I don't have to think for the meal planning. That was a big thing. And, and like you, I resisted it for many years and now I meal plan for the month. So the last week of the month, I'll set out the meals for the next month. Um, and I have this wall calendar. It's, well, it's a magnet calendar. It's on the fridge. We have the stainless steel fridge and it's on there. And I use a dry erase marker. And after I've figured out what we're doing, um, I put it on there and everybody knows. So I order my groceries because that's the one thing that I can't 
fit in really well is to go grocery shopping. <laughs> so I don't have help in the house or anything like that, but I pay to have my groceries delivered. And that's just a lifesaver for me between the working and the homeschooling. And I never really liked grocery shopping anyway. So I order my groceries based on the week's meals. And then even if I'm not home, because I used to travel quite a bit for my job, I only travel a little bit now, um, they could start dinner or they could get it done. It keeps me on budget. I look at the thing in the morning. I say, all right, I have to get this, this, and this done. And generally, my dinner is prepped and ready to be cooked well before dinner time. Yeah, so no, yeah. I don't yeah. think about it. You talked about was, and, and I want to, you know, one of the things you and I, I know get that question all the time is, is how do I manage that? You know, like uh, getting dinner on the table. And, and I know you, again, in that talk in the t- and you know, you gave to us, you talked a lot about <laughs> how much space it takes in our head when we're worrying about dinner all the time. No, it's crazy, isn't it? It takes yeah. up this huge amount of everybody I've t- spoken to, whether they homeschool or they don't, dinner takes up a huge amount of space in your head. And when somebody says to you, Oh, I'm just gonna bring a pizza home, it's like they gave you six hours a day, but it never takes six hours to make dinner. So uh, it's just amazing. That's why I try to before I was meal planning, I would at least try to know what I was cooking for dinner by 10 o'clock in the morning. So I could at least prep things. You can, you can chop up the onion or get the potatoes boiled or whatever it is. Um, And now that I have it done for the month and it's done for the month, but you know, you have to be a little bit flexible. So if something comes up, you know, or if your husband says, I'm going to take you out to dinner, (laughs) the kids are, you're on your own (laughs) or chicken nuggets are fine for everybody, but um, you have to be a little bit flexible, but I I got it started. I simply sat down with the kids and my husband one, one day at dinner with a notebook and said, what are your favorite meals? What do you like to eat? And then I wrote all that list down and I added in, you know, salads and vegetables and things like that because nobody ever picked a vegetable (laughs) and just put it in the meal plan. And I tried to arrange it like on Tuesdays and Thursdays were quite busy out of the house in the evening. So that might be a crock pot meal or something that can just be kept warm as people are in and out. And Sundays are always a nicer dinner. And then I plan for leftovers maybe from Sunday onto Tuesday. And so it, it sounds like it's a lot of work, but it's not, it takes me about 15 minutes to plan the month's meals and I'll pull out some cookbooks and maybe once a month, try a new recipe. And then two days a month, a kid gets to pick the meal. Mm. So this tomorrow is my daughter Katie's choice <laughs> and she yeah. chose brief uh, broccoli cheddar soup. So I planned for that. I asked her on Monday when I was ordering the groceries, what do you want? She told me so, and that they get very excited when it's their night. Yes. So yes. <laughs> that keeps it, it do keeps you, it fun. Do you said the kids sometimes, if you can't get to it, it's on the main meal plan. What do you do about um, training the kids to cook for themselves? And do people do their own lunches, things like that? What are some help? They do. They mostly, I don't do breakfast. Um, They cook their own breakfast and I start them cooking as soon as they can safely reach the stove. You can have a kid scramble an egg. Yeah. As soon as they can, that's an easy thing to start with or grilled cheese or something like that. Or um, if they can safely get in and out of the oven, if you have the anything frozen, you know, for, for lunch, a frozen pizza or frozen chicken nuggets, is, it's a good way to show them um, oven safety using oven mitts, um, things like that. So as soon as they're really old, which is probably around eight years old, mm-hmm. I guess. Yes, I so, agree. Yeah, my little guy, he's he's 12, he'll be 13 next week. He He can cook an entire meal by himself. You know, and they all know as they get a little older, this is what the crock pot is. This is how we use it. Um, and honestly, if they're cooking, I am not picky. You know, sometimes they will say, oh, can I cook for, can I cook dinner? You can, sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Go <laughs> you know? ahead, make your favorite. Go ahead My and husband do whatever always, you like. There's always <laughs> one person in the family who doesn't like that particular meal. So like, right. just, just make that the fact. But then, yeah, for us, once our kids got to the teen years, we actually had the match up the big guys with a little guy that would be their like sous chef. So they were like kids in training, <laughs> but they got to pick the meal. You're cooking it. You pick it. <laughs> yeah, that's and and you, these are life skills. I mean, think about a home ec class, but it's it's kids have to know how to do these things. I can't tell you how many of um, mine and my husband's relatives, younger nieces and nephews, graduate college, move into their apartments and they don't know how to cook in it or they're eating out constantly, spending a fortune because the oven is this big mysterious box. (laughs) Just, you have to learn how to cook. You have to learn how to clean. You have to learn how to take care of your laundry. It's self-care in the most basic way. And, and homeschool moms 
graduate kids who know how to do things. You know, they know how to hang a picture and they know how to jump a car engine and they know how to do all these things because they, they've worked with their families. And it's important, though. It's really important to not be incompetent in life. Right. Right. So little, so much is done. I think we always say that, uh, you know, this generation of children and especially everything's kind of expected instantly as well. And, and they don't know how to do for themselves. So um, you do, Mary Ellen, you talk also about laundry, you know, like there's three things I think you had mentioned. It was, um, yeah, uh, planning out that dinner before 10 o'clock, being able to have, uh, you know, and, but there were two other things. One was laundry and doing school every day. Let's, Talk a little bit about that. So what about laundry since we're on the household home chores kick here? Laundry is extremely important. You need to get the laundry done. I once um, told my husband, I can either do laundry or cook dinner. You know, this is when the children were very young. Um, so we had a pizza because <laughs> he, he was in need of clean underwear. So <laughs> he brought home a pizza. Um, it's get whatever amount of laundry you think you can do in one day whether it's one load, two loads, three loads, but done is folded and put away. Mm -hmm. Done is not on the couch or on the dining room table or in your bed or something like that, because then the pile just gets shifted somewhere else at the end of the day. Cause you're tired when you go to, you want to go to bed and there's a pile of laundry. You're not going to do it. You're not going to fold it and put it away. You're not going to wake up the kids to put it away. So, and what I would do if it, if it got overwhelming is that I would just pile it on my bed and have everybody come and help me fold the laundry. So yeah. I'd have, you know, five kids helping me fold the laundry. It's done in two minutes and take your laundry and go away. You yeah, know, and they call it family fold. I'd be like, yeah. okay, meet me in my bedroom, family fold. <laughs> yes. A five-year-old can fold laundry confidently and a three-year-old can open a drawer and put it away. So it's, again, that's these life skills, but whatever the amount you can do in a day that you can all together do, do that every day, you know, not on Sunday, give yourself a day off. And if you need help, ask for help. I'm a big believer in ask for help. I spent many years not asking for help and telling people I could do everything. I can't do everything. That's crazy. You need help. So like I order in groceries, if you want to send out your laundry, I will not judge you. I think it's a great idea, you know, <laughs> but yeah, just get done. Yeah. For me, it's vacuuming is like the thing I absolutely hate doing. And then, you know, <laughs> it was, but yet we had a dog and lots of kids and nine people living in the house. It had to be done every day. So yeah. we, we, we farmed it out to everybody was we round robin, you know, each month of somebody else's turn. <laughs> See, and that's great. Just pick the thing you don't really like to do and farm it out to a kid or ask your husband's help. Or if you can afford help, you should get help. I mean, you're employing somebody else who probably needs the money and you're helping yourself. It's your sanity, your sanity, you know, therapy is expensive too. So what would you rather pay for? Right, right. So one of, you know, chores, that's, that is one of those things. So, so laundry, do you switch at a certain time where the teens start doing their own? Is, mm -hmm. is there, um... At 10 years old, they start doing their own laundry. Mm -hmm. um, and I supervise that for a while until like they've got it right. Only because I'm, you know, I don't want them to break my washing machine because they will throw everything in there. I once found a boot in there. <laughs> so they just scoop and throw, you know, that's how they clean your room. Everything just goes in the wash. So I supervise that for a while. And then I, I do mine and my husband's laundry on Mondays and Thursdays, and they can do their laundry any other time, whenever they fit it in, as soon as I'm done with mine. Um, and I do the bed linens on Tuesdays. So, yeah. And I know that makes me sound like I'm super organized. I'm really not. <laughs> it's just that I my kids are older now and I found ways to work within my schedule because I work full time and I still homeschool and, and they can help me. When my kids were little, it, my husband used to call it the pitchfork method. Whatever was dirty around, we would just shovel it to the washing machine and get it done as, as best we could. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, oh, she has it all together. I, you know, my youngest is going to be 13. I have kids who've moved out. I have kids who are grown in their twenties. Um, I'm quite old now and I like to go to bed early. So, so don't think that um, it's always been this way for different stages of your life. You can only do certain things, you know, and when you're tired and you have little ones and, and you've been up all night or I, I just realize how defeating it can sound when, when somebody else seems to have it all together. If you're taking care of little kids and you're, you're, getting them fed and homeschooled and, and to sleep, you're doing a great job. You're doing everything God intends for you. And don't worry, the other stuff will come. You'll get there, I promise. 
Oh, no, it's um, so important that you're saying it that way, Mary Ellen, because it's like, you know, the things we're talking about are things, they're kind of like goals and places to reach and things to get there that will make it easy. But, but you're right. It's like all bets are off when we have, you know, a stomach flu going through the house or a newborn who just is very colicky and needs you to hold them the whole time. But I, I love what you said is, is inviting. And that's the thing. It's really hard to humble ourselves. We tend to feel like I can't ask for help. Yeah. And yet in many ways, it makes, it makes the family more noble. You know, if they're saying, Hey, uh, I'm an active contributor to this, fa- the good of the family. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, it feels almost like, Oh, well, I've had, I've had the occasion and, and I think other people have had this too. Cause I, I chose to have this large family or God chose this large family for me. And I was open to it. I chose to homeschool and I'm a little bit underwater now. And when you've asked for help, people have said, well, you know, you could just put them in school or, you know, you're pregnant again. And it's just, you know, you just feel so judged and upset. And, and so people are afraid to step out and ask for help. Um, So what you should do is ask for help within your community, your support community. Um, I have close, close friends who homeschooled who have large families. I have close, close friends who have kids in school and have small families and who just would say yes to anything I asked them to do. Can you pick this one up? Can you take them that way? You know, can you do this? And, and they're just, most people are just genuinely happy to help, you know, especially people like at my age, I've helped younger families with smaller children to do things. And I'm happy to do that. Call me and ask me, I will do anything. I'll bring you a meal. I'll take your kids for an afternoon. I'm because ha- I'm I don't have little kids and I'm getting sleep. So you have to find your support and be be aware that it's there's nothing wrong with asking for help. There is abs- I mean, Jesus chose 12 people to help him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he needed friends. He needed support. So, uh, you know, we need we need each other. We need each other. So don't don't let maybe a defeating conversation hold you back from seeking the support that you need. So speaking of support, one of the other big things is support from our spouses. You know, uh, one of those other things you talk about is consulting your spouse, you know, uh, being on the same page. How important is all of that? It's really important, particularly if your spouse is not the one doing all the homeschooling. So they're kind of, they, they feel like they can't say anything about maybe what you've chosen for a a curriculum or how, or ask how they're doing because they're not so involved the same way you wouldn't ask that person. Like my husband's a CPA. I wouldn't say to him, so how many clients you see today? How much, you know, how many, how many billing hours you have? (laughs) I'm not doing it. You know, I would feel weird doing that, but it's so important because, um, and I'm just, I'm going to say husband because that's our situation as I homeschool, but I realize a lot of dads do too, but so forgive me, but I, it's important for me to get his perspective because they're his children too. And he has a point of view sometimes that I don't have. He sees things that I don't see. That's why this works, this complementary kind of relationship that we have, the male and the female, um, especially when it comes to the boys. He can, he's like, he can see things that I can't because I was never a boy. So we try to have um, parent teacher meetings, he and I, and what that means is usually it takes me to brunch. And I tell him what's going on and I ask him for help in certain things or ask for his opinion. Um, we have one special needs uh, child. He's, he's 15. He's in 10th grade. And so I have to bounce ideas off him about that and how I'm doing with that. And um, the 12 year old, you know, he's a 12 year old boy and he needs a lot of physical activity and a lot of exertion. And um, that's really kind of my husband's department. And sometimes the discipline you know, um, sometimes it's better for them to hear the booming dad voice than my voice. I tend to be a little gentler. Um, so I bring those kinds of issues to him. So he's involved. And I'll say, you know, I, I don't think this is going well in this particular subject. Can you help? What, what are your suggestions? We use the Seton curriculum. And I love it because, um, especially with this special services department for my son, um, it's very flexible. And they've allowed me to switch things out that don't quite work. And, and, they, they work very closely with me about um, getting Sean to where he needs to be. So, and David's been very involved in that. And I think it's also important to let dad kind of set some goals for the homeschool too. You know, I, I know a woman quite well who was doing um, 
I guess it was like a Charlotte Mason kind of a thing where it was very literature based what she was doing. And her husband at one point said to her, you know, I'd like to be a spelling test or something like a math test. Like he didn't kind of get what she was doing. And she went, oh, OK, you know, and then they worked together and they ended up in this. Now I know her. She they, they ended up enrolling in Seton and it just went so much better for them because that really suited his way of thinking about education. And she just never knew that. And then the organization helped her. So. And maybe it's the opposite for you. Maybe you're you're using a, um, a box curriculum, but you, your husband thinks you should be trying something else. So you work together on how to educate your children. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know my husband definitely, I, I, I always say, he was the one that actually encouraged me to homeschool. <laughs> you know, I was told That's the funny story that it was like, I'm like, those people are in a cult. What are you trying to ask <laughs> me to do? You know? And he was like, so very much my cheerleader and supportive of that. But it really stemmed from us praying together and getting to the very fundamental, what are our goals of education? You know, yeah. do you have that kind of conversation? You know, you we say? do. We do. Um, we try to pray together about it and separately about it and what our goals are for the kids. Um, some, for some of them, it's been college. And for some of them, it's not yet. Um, or for our Sean, he's going to be with us a while. So our goal is to find out where, where God needs him to be you know, and what God intends for his life, it's going to be a different life than the ones who've gone to college. Um, so we have to, you, we, you have to really bring those kinds of things to prayer because it's not always clear where your child's going to be. You know, we had one graduate high school during the whole lockdown and the quarantine, and she, she wasn't the most academic of my children. And she's so talented and so wonderful and smart, but she was just nervous about starting college it, you know, during the quarantine with it being online, which is not her best way to learn. And so she's working full time now while she figures that out. So it wasn't a clear goal. Like, you know, the way the other ones were just, they, they were clearly meant to go to college. And this one, we're not quite sure now. So we have to talk about that a lot and help guide her. Um, And it's always a very prayerful decision. Mm -hmm. And I encourage moms um, and dads, even if you only get two minutes in the morning before he leaves for work to just say an hour father together, pray together as often as you can. You know, if it's two seconds here or, you know, Jesus, I trust in you or, uh, and pray for him during the day. You know, when you're folding your shirts, just think, pray for him. When you're, when you're planning your dinner and you know, he's going to eat it, pray for him. Um, especially those spouses who work outside the home and go out into the world. It can be, you know, it's difficult, especially now. Well, anytime, but I mean, gosh, the world is so crazy now. So pray for each other and and take that time, even if it's just a minute in the morning to just hold hands and say an Our Father or Hail Mary or whatever it is that that suits you and pray for pray for each other as often as you can. Yeah, I know one of the, I'll skip all the way to the number 10, which is about the marriage uh, tip that you talk about. It's um you know, you did give us a beautiful talk last year at the conference about romancing, you know, your spouse. Yeah. How, what, what about our marriage? You know and I mean? Yeah. We need to get together on our educational goals, but, but also um, sometimes it kind of, your spouse is kind of like, you feel like it's a given and he kind of just takes a back seat. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's very, very easy to slide into that. And, and our priorities really should be God and our marriage and then our children, because without the solid marriage, it all falls apart. And we've seen that Unfortunately, most of us know that and it's, we know some marriages that have failed and, and the kids are just, it, it creates a lot of chaos in people's lives and marriages, you know, they need work, they need to be paid attention to, they need to be nurtured and, and, and it's just really, really important. So um, I just, in that, in that talk, I had just a couple of little things and I do, I have given a whole marriage talk, but keeping your romance alive and, and looking at your husband the way you did when you first started dating him and trying to see that man all the time, it really does help. Like I, I said, make a home date on a regular basis. Um, if you can't get out, if, if you have a, a tight budget or it's hard to get babysitters, we used to do this um, years ago. We had, we had no money. <laughs> we had a million children and no money. And so on Saturdays, after we were done with all the kid activities and, and the running around, it was usually around four o'clock. We would either put them in front of the, a video or put them outside. Um, 
and we would have an hour to ourselves. So I would make a special cocktail or pour a nice glass of wine for each of us. And I would have some kind of special little appetizer, which I had to hide from the children because they find anything and eat it. Right? <laughs> Tucked back into the freezer, I would have something. And it would just be the two of us for an hour or so, just chatting, just pretending all of this wasn't going on around us, just catching up, you know? It was just a nice little time. I put on um, my Frank Sinatra music because I love that. And it would just be like grown up time. And that really got us through, you know, a couple of years of not being able to do too much outside of the house. Um, and now we, we, we go out um, probably twice a month. We, we have a date and it's really important. Um, if you could switch babysitting, we've done that with friends who also have, um, you know, had the same age kids, we would switch, bring the kids over, you take a date and then we would do it the next week. So find creative ways to be together that way. Um, and, Make him welcome at home. That was another thing. When he comes in the door, and, and gentlemen can do this too for, for their wives, um, make sure the kids greet him. Hello, daddy's home. Make sure you greet him. You know, stop what you're doing, put down the phone or step away from the, the dinner and just go and give him a hug and a kiss and say, I'm glad you're home. You know, how was your day? And then give him like 15 minutes to kind of regroup and get into dad mode. You know, he was in work mode and now he needs a minute and then he'll be in dad mode. So give him that time a little bit. I, I found that when I did give my husband 15 minutes to go, you know, just go uh, take a shower or or just change into his comfy clothes or go outside and do something at the lawn for a few minutes, it just gave him time to decompress. And, and then he was very much more present for us. And I found that when I was um, traveling a lot in my speaking engagements, when I walked in the door, I just needed a few minutes to become mom again. You know, I just needed that time. And that's when I started paying more attention. When I started working more full time, I was like, wow, this is really hard. <laughs> it's hard to come home to a house full of people after all this. So I started paying more attention to giving him some free time to, to get into dad. And we I would also, we, we also, we would also, you know, you kind of, you're right. It's like the kids and I, you're home, you're in your groove, you're in your routine. And now this other person's coming into the picture. How do they fit in? It's honoring that they have decompression, you know, decompression time. They need that. But also you want to show how happy you are and make them a part. Yeah. It's not like you, all of us and dad's out there, an outlier. <laughs> right. And that he's, he's often expressed that those were some of the happiest days when he walked in the, the door and all these little, you know, pajama people would come running up to him. Daddy, daddy. You know, I, I think that's nice when you encourage the kids to do that. It's a nice memory for them. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know one of those things uh, for us too, is also read aloud time. We would have, um, uh, and, and at a certain point it was the kids were at different ages. So, you know, I had like the little ones, he had the teens and then we would, you know, swap it and it's making memories together by reading stories aloud with, with, you know, both spouses to get to know yeah. each other. That's mm -hmm. great. I love that. <laughs> It's good. So one of the other things I know, uh, two, two more tips I wanted to bring up before. And, and as I said, we could do this, we could do this again. I'd love to invite you to come again because it's just sure. such a wealth of knowledge. But um, two things. One was I want to talk about the importance of giving your children nature and outside time. And then talking about also, especially because we're you and I are recording this in this mid-year, the temptation of this isn't working. Let me switch the curriculum. So let's first talk about nature. Nature is extremely important. Um, I always thought it was important because there's so much new agey occult stuff about the earth and the environment and stuff like that. And I think it's important for children to, to know that God created this beautiful place for us to live in. We need to be good stewards of it. We need to recognize its beauty and its order and all these things. And I'm not a really sciencey person and I am not by nature an outdoorsy person. I kind of feel like outdoors is a place where you just mess up your hair and muck up your shoes. <laughs> I was raised by a woman who like broke into hives if she was more than 40 miles from the Lord and Taylor. <laughs> it's just not my thing, but I recognize how important it is. So getting the kids out, do nature walks, just even walk around your neighborhood get some fresh air. Fresh air and exercise is so good for everybody. Everybody. It just lightens your mood. It's sunshine. We all need vitamin D. Um, and if you can take them out with, with a bug box or um, the clippers to cut flowers or to, to make sure to uh, put out a bird feeder and you can look at the birds and start a bird list, this really connects them 
to God's beauty and creation in a very healthy and way that honors God and doesn't make like the earth is not your mother. The trees do not have feelings like all that kind of weird stuff that they're going to hear out there. You know, this is and we should be good stewards of this. So doing things like planting a garden or growing a bean or releasing butterflies. You know, I used to buy the cocoons and then we put the butterflies out and, and we did ladybugs one year. This is all really good stuff. It's it's and and to cultivate their interest in things like you might have a budding naturalist, you might have a biologist, you know, and so to explore nature in a really good and healthy way like that and and find new trails and maybe go fishing in a pond and stuff like that. And again, it's the memories. You're building beautiful memories and such solid family time with your kids. I mean, they have even dragged me camping. I have slept in a tent. (laughs) <laughs> not my thing but they love they laugh they still laugh about me in a tent and and my various adventures in camping yeah I'm with <sighs> you it's like I'm not a tent girl either I'm this <sighs> New York City girl really hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> really hard it's chilly though hard. I mean it's a great way to take a bunch of people on vacation it's just you know you're outside <laughs> it's just exactly exactly <laughs> but so but does it have to necessarily be formal like school lessons do you just sometimes throw them outside <laughs> yes and lock the door and, <laughs> and 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 you know drink your coffee and get some peace it's outside every day for at least 15 minutes if they're dressed appropriately they're not going to melt they're not going to die they're going to get some fresh air. They get the wiggles out. You know, I would do it at lunchtime outside, no matter what, go walk the dog, go play in the yard, go build a fort. And you know what? A lot of times they would moan and groan. And then I was dragging them back in. Right. You know, and, and don't sweat the fact that they're going to get muddy. They're going to, you know, they're going to stain their clothes. They're gonna, you shouldn't have the nice clothes on anyway during homeschool. You should be in the clothes that you don't care if they get dirty. That's what thrift stores are for. <laughs> Buy those, you know, those two dollar t shirts you don't care about. And then when they get back in, they're less wiggly, they're less, you know, they're more calm. They're they're able to focus a little bit better. And then they're probably anxious to go back out as soon as you're done for the day. But that time, it also is the time when you can throw in the laundry, or you can have a quiet cup of coffee, or you know, ring up your mother on the phone and see how she's doing, or whatever. You know, it's it gives you fifteen minutes of just peace and quiet to catch up with what you need to. So I'm hearing you know, things that naturally happen in life kind of count as school in a way oh, yes. and without it being so formal, but it's also life. So I know it's a homeschool life, isn't it? It's not a, yeah, just it's, it's a lifestyle. It's not homeschool. Isn't something you do. It's something you live. It's it, you're always doing it. You know, whether they're cooking their scrambled eggs in the morning or they're, they're, you know, helping grandma out with something. This is this is how life is lived. Education shouldn't just be in a box in a school, in a, in a building, in a, in a book. Education is is lived constantly, and that's what we have the the great privilege of being able to do. Yeah, and I love making memories together, and that's too. For us, our goal was always our children being close to each other, and I know that those those are incredible bonds that will never leave them. But I, I wanted to bring up again that whole idea of, you know, you talk about, um, do we switch up the, commi- you know, right now people are probably starting to think about, you know, planning for the next year, but then they hit a wall with certain subjects. What do we do when that happens? Yeah, that it's it, especially now at this time of year where you're kind of sick of being in the house and we've been in the house a lot more than most people have, you know, in years previously. And you get into that February dark, cold month for a lot of us. Um, it feels so imperative to do something new. And in my speaking around the country and talking to so many homeschool moms, both um, Seton moms and non-Seton moms, I have found that most of the time when people are saying, oh, my seventh grader is so off on math, he's way behind. Well, what program do you use? Well, I've used this, 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 and this, and this. That might be why. <laughs> there are certain things where we're just not going to like it. Like the, the, the child may not like math. And, and your problem isn't that the program is wrong. It's that the child doesn't like math. But we need to learn how to do math. And we need to learn how to make this part of our lives. So picking one curriculum and sticking with it for a while is the way to do that. And that's part of that discipline thing. Like we don't always like everything. And yes, sometimes it's tedious. 
you know, diagramming sentences is tedious and doing narrations is tedious and all that kind of stuff. But you have to give it like a full on year or so before you decide this really isn't working. Now, if there are issues like um, uh, some special needs issues or dyslexia or something like that, that has to be addressed separately. And you need to, um, I know, well, Seton has an excellent special services department. I know some of the other uh, curriculum companies do as well. And there's always getting specialists in to help. There's no failure in hiring a tutor for things, but you really have to power through and not change up, throw out the baby with the bathwater every time somebody's or, or you're all just kind of bored and, and feeling unfocused. It's, it may not be the curriculum, it might be the circumstances. So take a week off, you know, do a couple of field trips if you can, um, or, or spend some time. I know it's hard now to go out and do things in museums and stuff like that, but you can do virtual tours mm-hmm. or take a few days and go visit grandma or, or plant that garden or go sledding if it's snowing and things like that. And kind of just take a little bit of a break And then when you come back to it, it might feel fresher and it might feel more doable to you. And I'm not saying there's never any reason to not to to not sweat to switch. There's ever you know what I mean. (laughs) There are reasons to switch. (laughs) Up there, (laughs) but it, it should be kind of the last resort because I've seen so many times where people have switched so many times that the children are actually missing great big pockets of information, you know, and you don't want that. There are gaps in every education, but you don't want them to miss like division because you've switched the math curriculum five times, you know, and they keep skipping over that somehow. Yeah, it's important to be disciplined in your choices and not be kind of a curriculum magpie. So that's, that is, so a couple of things I'm hearing you're, you're suggesting is like this kind of idea that one is don't like, a, undermine your choices in the, by second guessing yourself. And then yeah. the, the other one is also just is, well, how do you know something's working and it's not working, you know, um, and what's that best fit for a kid? Like, h- how do you tackle that? Well, yeah, that can be difficult to find the best fit for each one of your learners, because not everybody learns the same way. Not everybody's on the same path. I've had a lot of that in my homeschool because I've had some special needs kids and some kids with different strengths and weaknesses. Um, what I ha- And also, it also has to work for mom. I just want to make that point too, because um, it has to be something you can teach and something you can support. Um, for example, I had at one point five kids doing Saxon math. Saxon math is an excellent program. It's terrific. I was losing my mind because I, it, it's a lot to grade. It's a lot to keep up with. And then we switched to uh, teaching textbooks and it was like the angels started singing and everybody was, talking. and my kids did really well in math because it just suited them. So they started not hating math. They didn't start loving math. Nobody loved math. And I still get a little bit of eye rolling when it's time to do math, but it's doable for me because grading six, seven, at one point, you know, seven kids being homeschooled. Saxon was just too much for me. I couldn't do it. And maybe it's something else for you. But evaluating how they're doing, if they're if they're getting, I would evaluate them. Like every Friday, I sit down with the kids individually and say, all right, what did you do this week? Because this is how I keep up with not letting somebody get away with not doing math for a week or something. So I'm always picking on math. Math is fine. It's just not my favorite thing. So <laughs> math is one of the <laughs> Math is one of the top, like number one things, moms, when I've surveyed hundreds of families, it is math. Undoubtedly. Yeah. That I know it is. Number one. It, it's just the one that I, everybody seems to have issues with. And I'm just, I've never, I'm, you know, I'm a writer. I was an English lit major. And even though I walk, worked on Wall Street for many years, I, it's just not my thing, you know, and I married an accountant, so I never have to do math again. <laughs> but I evaluate every Friday and I'll go through, all right, what did you do this week? What did I miss? What did you miss? What did you struggle with? And as long as everybody's making steps forward, I can be confident that what we're doing, the curriculum that I've chosen is okay. When somebody starts really hitting a wall, that's when I say, all right, we have to see what's going on here. Is it just that you're not getting this particular lesson? Is it, am I not presenting this right? Maybe I need to be a little bit more involved next week with this. You know, so you homeschooling is really hard work for moms. It really is. It takes a lot of time and you have to be involved, especially when they're younger. Um, in my case, then I, I've had occasion to call the counselors at Seton. They have um, academic counselors. So you can call and say, listen, 
she's really not getting this. Do you have any suggestions? And they do. They that's what they do. They tell you how to how to teach it, and the kids can call them too. Um, and I know the other curriculum companies do that. And and I know even Homeschool Connections, their teachers are often available via email and stuff like that. So, um, but I just do that February um, February Friday meetings every week with each kid to kind of evaluate. And that's how I know we're, we're on track. And it's not that I haven't switched a book out here and there. I have. It's just that um, I, it, it's so much easier for me to stay disciplined and to stay focused if I stick with the same curriculum. Because year after year, now I know how to teach it. Right. You know, Because I've done this for, I've been enrolled, oh my gosh, probably 15 of the 20 years I've been homeschooling. So I know what I'm doing. I've got it with this. So I'm comfortable so I can make them more comfortable with it. It seems like you also tailored it to make it work for your family. And, and that's something, you know, again, yes, experience has taught you, but but you're not switching things around every week. Right. Yeah. And and I know uh, newer families get nervous with, with the Seton curriculum is that, oh, I have to do all of this. And it, it seems like so overwhelming. I don't do all of it. There's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> I don't do all of it. I like to be done by three o'clock. So I pick and choose in there what I'm going to do and what I'm going to submit to them and what I want graded and things like that. So it, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's, it's a, you're in charge. And, and that's true of whatever homeschool method you choose, you're in charge. You, the mom and the dad, the parents are in charge. And you make the decisions. And sometimes the children aren't going to like those decisions. But that doesn't mean you have to switch the whole thing around because he's not loving his English book or his, or writing his essays or whatever. So it's about trusting yourself, being able to also give yourself permission to take time to see what's really, truly going on. Yes. Yeah. Because it may not be the curriculum is same, maybe other things, like you said, it may be that you didn't realize they're having trouble with whatever word problems. They don't know how to decipher. And therefore we're going to just focus block learning on word problems until they feel more confident. And then the rest we can progress on. So right, exactly. you know, you're not on a timetable with school, you know, it's mastery learning. We don't, it's not yeah. just checking off boxes. I always feel badly when people feel like they're behind because they stopped and, and for two weeks did long division with a kid. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. You know, you're not behind as long as they're learning and you're and you're addressing whatever problems they have. Because I, my oldest son was in uh, public school and he had autism and he was special needs, and they would they would just zoom right over. Like they told me they were going to put him in fourth grade. This is when I pulled him out of school. Um, they were going to put him in fourth grade in the fourth grade math, and he hadn't learned to multiply yet. He 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 had um, intelligence. He had a lower intelligence. Um, so a lower IQ, I should say. So he couldn't multiply. And then they started fourth grade with division. Well, you can't do division if you can't multiply. And I said, well, how are we going to address this? He'll pick it up. No, we won't. <laughs> like you don't just pick that up, especially when you're a person who struggles with learning. So when I brought him home, we spent months on the multiplication tables and he eventually got it. He did. And then we moved on to division. I mean, but I wasn't behind because it took me months to teach him that. That's what he needed. So when people say, oh, I'm behind because he's struggling and, uh, you know, all the other fourth graders are doing this or, or he should be in fifth grade, but I, we're doing this at the fourth grade level. That's what he needs. That's fine. There's no expiration date on your kids, yeah. right? They're, they're going to be with you as long as they need to be with you to learn what they need to learn. Right. And then sometimes you will, you will skip certain things because you're concentrating on that one important area. And like you said, you can't do division without really understanding multiplication. So it's like, yeah, yeah. let's do that. You know, exactly. Yeah. And if you scale back on, say, history or science for a little right. while so you can really nail down the math or the English or the writing or the reading, learning how to read is big. Um, that's OK, because history is not going anywhere. Like you'll catch up with that at some point. It's fine. <laughs> you will, you will. And you know, I'm in this lofty position where I have launched all seven of my children. My youngest is now just about in his last semester of college. Yay. And then you Yay. know, you one of those, you know, yeah, my, I have two that were nature lovers and one is a biologist, um, you know, working in laboratory and another one's in a professional horticulture program. So you never know 
the seeds that you've planted by allowing that freedom where it's going to take your children. So yeah. that's amazing. A professional horticulture program. What a cool yeah. thing it is. And it's great. There's a, a garden near us called Longwood gardens and um, they run a program and it's fully funded and it's for two years and she lives there. It's just amazing. But again, it all started with this love of nature and the ability to say, go outside, <laughs> go have my cup of tea and just get that. And it was giving them the ability to just discover awe, wonder of the, the world God has created. And I know it's so exciting to see that they find something, especially when it's something a little unusual like that. Like that's, that's a cool thing that I wouldn't have thought of, but what a great I just think that's amazing. And I've, I've heard that kind of thing time and again, where a kid just got really into something. And the next thing you know, it's his career. And I love that. I just yeah. love that. Yeah, it's, it's great. Really great. And, and it turned out, you know, this was a garden that we take, we, we take our kids as a family. It was a family place that we always just went to, to just as the seasons changed. So, so yeah, you and I both know it. it is about the side trips, you know, you mm -hmm. take on this and, and I love, and also Jen McIntosh who had, you know, people haven't heard her talks too. She echoes much of this as well, reinforcing and affirming this lifestyle. But she says, yeah, homeschooling is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It is. Yeah, it, is. it is. And it's a wonderful, long, terrific thing that can be really, really hard and frustrating. But the end goal is heaven for all of us, ultimately. And I have to say, just, um, you know, I didn't have I don't have the most scholarly children. Nobody's winning scholarships to Harvard. But the ones who graduated are all doing well. They're good, sweet kids who go to church, who love their family, who would do anything for anybody. And they're all very successful in their careers and in their, their academics so far. So, um, and I, I didn't do anything unusual. I'm not, I'm not the best homeschool mom out there. I, I think if you just focus on the prize, which is uh, fam love of God and love of family, loving each other and just doing your best every day, you're going to be fine. You really are. You really are. So, you know, just do your best every day. What a wonderful way to, you know, end this beautiful podcast is again, those beautiful affirming words. And you're right, because uh, we don't do things perfectly. We can't, and don't expect perfection, no. but, but you're, you know, God makes straight crooked lines and he's got to constantly come behind me. <laughs> me too. Me too. Or like a big eraser. <laughs> constantly. It's great. Well, it's been such a joy to speak with you again. I hope you'll come back at some point. I, I know, you. Thank you. Know, you. Uh, it's such a blessing people. This is being recorded so people can listen, take notes, do take copious notes from this and be able to implement some of these wonderful words of wisdom from Mary Ellen. Where can people find you if they do want to extend a conversation and perhaps ask questions? Sure. Um, well, I'm on Facebook. Um, so you can absolutely find me there, Mary Ellen Barrett. Um, I can be emailed at bonniebluehouse at gmail.com. It's Bonnie with a Y, B O N N Y B L U E H O U S E at gmail.com. Um, yeah, that's just the, e those are the two easy ways to get me. I'm, I'm checking the email all the time. Your blog, I've seen some articles and some of the things we talked about is in that blog as well. And we'll put those links. I will have us put those links underneath this video. You'll be able to see some of the links to get to you, Mariel. Thank you. Thank you. This has been great. Well, thank you again so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm just so happy and pleased that you are here. Let us know who else you'd like to have on the podcast as I'm scheduling out this new year. I'd be happy to hear from you and continue the conversation in the Catholic homeschool community. We'll be posting uh, links for this as well in the community and on our YouTube channel. Take care and God bless. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it and subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can find us on all your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. Thank you and have a blessed day.